this video is just an overview of what happened to my car recently and how I diagnosed the problem and how I repaired it. So after returning from Auto Club Speedway, I noticed that the car had a rough idle. I hooked up INPA and INPA was showing me that cylinder number three was weak. I decided to switch the coil, the injector, and the spark plug with cylinder one and retested it. Cylinder three still showed up weak. I then did a compression test and the compression test showed that cylinder three had a compression leak. I removed the intake manifold and introduced compressed air into the spark plug hole and put a little oil over the intake valves to see if the valves were leaking but it appeared that the valves were okay. This is the DIY I used to remove the intake manifold. So after doing some investigations online, I found that it is common for the ring lands on these motors, these N54s, to break. Um, on mine, the car was still running quite well. I just had a slight uh, miss in the idle. So I didn't suspect that it was a really bad situation, so I decided to um, try to remove the piston while the engine was still in place. Once the intake manifold is removed, you can move right into removing the turbos. I just made a video on that, so for me it was still fresh in my mind. Once the subframe and the turbos are removed, the next step would be to remove the oil pan. But if you have an automatic transmission like I do, then you'll need to remove the automatic transmission lines that go to the uh, heat exchanger or cooler like on mine. So um, in order to do that you'll need to remove this uh, single bolt out of the back of the transmission and uh, they just pull out the uh, front. Uh, if you purchase this tool it'll help you get the uh, quick disconnects off the front. The oil pan shown here shows the three horizontal bolts that hold on the oil pan in addition to the vertical bolting. Another thing you'll have to remove is the power steering pump. In order to do that, you'll have to use a T60 here in order to loosen the serpentine belt. You'll have to turn it clockwise and to overcome the spring tension and remove the belt. Once the belt's removed, then it's just a matter of taking the bolting off of the power steering pump and removing it. The oil scooper shown here is held on by the uh, vertical bolting and uh, is just pressed into the uh, oil pump. So once you get the bolts, vertical bolting off, you can just pull it right out of the oil pump. Since the engine is currently being supported by the bridge going across the engine bay, that is screwed into the head, I'll have to find a way to support the engine from underneath. So I made this bracket that's made with 3 16 angle iron, two by two, and it is uh, bolted into the uh, bottom of the engine and also bolted onto the scissor jack. In order to remove the oil pump, I inserted a quarter inch dowel pin here. The quarter inch dowel pin goes into another hole that's behind the sprocket and keeps it from turning. With the pin in, you'll now be able to loosen the bolt that's holding on the sprocket for the oil pump and remove the oil pump. For removing the head, I used this video and it is number 24 of the uh, Cubic DIY series of videos that this guy has posted. The head bolts are extremely tight so I wanted to purchase some high quality Torx bits that would work without breaking. I purchased these uh, Schwaben bits from ECS Tuning. In order to lift the head out of the engine compartment I used these six millimeter eye bolts, uh, these shackles, and this sling and I also used an adjustable tie down in the back to uh, be able to tilt the uh, head 
as it's coming out as it will not clear the uh, engine compartment unless you're able to uh, adjust the uh, angle of the head as you're lifting it out. The next step is to remove the pistons. In order to do that, I would need to rotate the crank. So I supported the timing chain as shown while I rotated the crank clockwise to get at the connecting rod bolts. Once the connecting rod bolts were loose, I would push out uh, the pistons through the top uh, two at a time and rotate to the next set until they were all out. Once the pistons and the connecting rods were out, I put them back together and uh, marked them. Note that the uh, bearings on each connecting rod are different top to bottom. They are also designated uh, sizes and that uh, designated size is listed and stamped on the front of the counterweight of the front uh, number one piston. Uh, if you rotate it until the uh, counterweight is at the bottom, you'll be able to read the size designation. Mine was RRRBRR, so the first three bearings were red designated and the uh, fourth one was blue and the last two were red. This is a picture of piston number three. Note that there are four cracks along the uh, ring lands underneath the first two rings. This was probably due to the fact of the severe detonation that had occurred at the track. I had received the code of severe detonation after tracking the car. Since the cylinder walls looked uh, untouched, I decided to order the standard size pistons to replace those. I ordered forged Molly pistons at 9.5 to 1 compression ratio. These pistons are similar to the pistons used in the Alpina E90B3. The rings for the Molly pistons will need to be fitted individually per cylinder. So in order to do that, you would place the uh, ring without the piston inside of each cylinder and uh, measure the end gap with a filler gauge. You can press the ring down about an inch using a piston to um, make sure that the uh, ring is sitting in a uh, part of the bore that is uh, more consistent. I made a ring filing tool, but as it turned out, it was not necessary and I think a uh, the hand crank uh, ring filer would do fine since uh, the rings only had to be uh, ground about one or two thousandths for each one. Upon inspection of the connecting rod bearings, it appeared that the area of contact was quite wide and uh, the wear was a bit concerning to me in that it looked like the profile of the bearing was starting to conform to the uh, diameter of the uh, journal of the crank. So this would cause a problem of uh, keeping the oil from wedging uh, between the uh, connecting rod bearing and the, the crank. So I decided that it would be a good idea to replace these bearings. I uh, did some investigation and uh, the WPC treatment where they bead blast the uh, stock bearings looked like a good prospect and so I decided to go with those. The crank journal designations listed in the BMW manual um, point to the fact that I needed uh, five of the red and yellow bearings and uh, one set of the violet and blue bearings um, since my uh, crankshaft had stamped on it RRRBRR. Molly recommends about a thousandth of an inch per 
inch of the diameter of your crank journal. So uh, since uh, the N54 has about a two inch diameter journal, I was looking for about a two thousandths uh, clearance on the connecting rod bearings. To check that, I ordered some uh, green plastic gauge from Amazon. For reassembly, I used the Quebec DIY series of videos once again. I went cheap on the ring compressor, which was a mistake. Um, the, this cheap, uh, cheap metal ring compressor rotates the rings as you're trying to compress them, so the ring gaps end up in the wrong place. Also, the uh, sheet metal starts to deform, so I don't recommend uh, using these sheet metal ring compressors, but I would recommend using the uh, tapered ring compressors uh, that are specific to the uh, particular size of the uh, piston bore. So this completes the video on replacing the pistons while the engine is still inside the car. I hope this gives you an idea of whether or not you want to try a job like this on your own. Now it's time for me to get the car back to the track and have some fun.